Hello folks, just starting up. Oh. In need of the coffee this evening. I uh, hope I haven't caught out too many people. It's uh, we're not in British summertime anymore. We're back on GMT. So some folks may be caught out by us being an hour out if they're not in the UK, if they're in the States or whatever. Apologies. Not much I can do about this silly uh, daylight saving on and off. Seems really cool. Weren't Europe gonna can that or something? Not that we're gonna be well, not that we are a part of Europe anymore. Sadly. <laughs> oh, hope everyone's had a good week so far. The weather's been kind of crap, is the only way of putting it, in the UK over the last few days. Definitely autumnal slash wintry. Lots of rain. Very grey, wind, generally crap. Mm. Right, the stream started. I'm just waiting for some people to connect. Waiting for everyone to start coming on. I don't know why there's such a huge delay on this. It drives me nuts. Better check on the old uh, mobile. Twitch. No. Not that one. Annoying, stop hassling me about getting this or the other app. Do I have the app running? Yes, I do. Hold on, come on. Come on. Okay, there's my Twitch connecting. Hey, how you doing, Ed? Only just a sec, I'm just checking um, the stream settings here. Okay, so it's got me live, it's good. My data rate looks okie dokie. Hey, how you doing, Nori? Here. 
No, we shouldn't do this. No, I don't want that. I just want the chat. Hmm. So how are you guys doing today? Well, this week even. What have you been up to? Why does it show me the chat on here? It's annoying. Let's start off with the um, community bits and pieces. Just program up a CPLD. Ew, a CPLD. Which which CPLD was that? Was it? Um, I don't really use CPLDs, but um, what manufacturer was that? Do you have to use a proprietary tool, or could you use the open tools? Beeb. 816 project. I don't know what that is. You're going to have to give me a URL. Xilink. Mm. Okay. Beeb 816. So, what is the Beeb 816, Ed? Get my um, stuff up here. Uh, 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 uh. This didn't take too much memory, it probably will. Google. I found the GitHub for it, um, Ed. Beeb 816. 65816. Upgrade VBC Micro. Including lots of fast RAM. So that extends the memory space, does it? Yeah, I was just being nosy, Ed. Seeing what it was. And um, what's Laurie been up to? Oh, he's been playing with Enmigen. I did see some of that. Because I um, mentioned it on some of the posts, which I should really cover in a second. Hold on, let me bring up my um, notes. So I forget, it would be helpful, wouldn't it? Oh, so L Laurie's granddaughter has now started Bristol University course online from his house. Well, yeah, it's all kind of mad, really. My my daughter's um, in her... Oh, she was in Diggs last year. This year she's in, uh, like, uh, they've got a shared house, her friends. Uh, she's been down there. She's down in Brighton. She's been down there since September. And she hasn't even been into university at all once. She started the course and everything, but it's all done online. The whole thing's been happening online, despite the fact that she's down there. But she gets to be with her friends and stuff. It's, you know, pe the uh, uh, people she met, you know, last year and stuff. So, 
just kind of enjoying it. But yeah, <laughs> it's bonkers. It's not our kind of university how it was. If you ever went. Oh, your niece is in Brighton. Hmm? Or would be. Yeah, it's all a bit bonkers, really, with the COVID stuff. I mean, they can pretty much do it all online anyhow. They're not doing much in the university, from what I understand. I mean, some universities may be doing more than others, but um, generally it's all online. So. Oh, it was last year, was it? No, okay, cool. Yeah, it's all a bit messed up. Right, so let's have a look then uh, on my list of community notes. So um, we had the alloy display. Wait a minute, before we do that, last week we, we, we were doing the bus. I've done a bit more on that. I now call it the ABC bus until somebody objects. I, I know Laurie was suggesting the ASB bus, but... Uh, one of the advantages, of course, is people say ASB bus, even though the B means bus. <laughs> Perfect. So, uh, and Laurie did a post following up from that, talking about, I mean, we were just doing simple register stuff. Then we were going to do, uh, we were going to, the ABC scheme. Uh, it's 126 registers in the first byte, or it's a long address um, to make the internal memory addressable from the outside, etc. That can then be used for buffering, etc., and those kind of purposes. So, if you wanted to do a, a output for um, like a video card or an input for a, a, a camera or something then you could directly buffer the memory in and out over the bus. Uh, and uh, so one of one of Laurie's points was, you know, once you go beyond simple register stuff, then you may think about putting a CPU inside the FPGA uh, and interfacing that, etc. And he was talking about using the... Uh, uh, there was quite an interesting one. Hold on. Let me just get the name up again. He did some links for hmm. Might CPU is one of the suggestions. Um, and it is quite an interesting one. Um, I'll put this up for anyone that hasn't uh, seen it. But go take a look. It really is extraordinarily um, simple. Um, very cool. Very small instruction set, but the, the space for many more instructions. Um, but if you look at the uh, Verilog, I mean, it's incredibly, um, incredibly simple. Uh, Tiny proc, was it? Yeah, this is very good. Shows you kind of how small it is. So that looks really interesting. I'd love to have a play around with that when I get time. Um, the other things that he was mentioning were, I'd forgotten about it as well. Uh, obviously, there's the Minerva RISC V CPU which is an mmigen derived or written CPU. And um, then he reminded me of the other thing, which was the uh, uh, one-page CPUs. Again, fairly simple ones. I should put a link in for that as well. Oh, yeah, and uh, Laurie has rewritten the uh, might CPU in mmigen as well. Which is kind of cool. It's going to be great. 
have some fun with that at some point. Um, <clears throat> so that was an interesting follow up uh, and I'm sure we do more on that some point soon particularly now that uh, Laurie's done the uh, and my jump port of the night. Uh, in terms of, there was another thread which was kind of interesting uh, that Laurie and I have been going through, which I think was the um, thread about. Uh, was it terminology? No, projects, alloy, possible projects. Um, and as part of that, Laurie was showing um, what he's working on, obviously, with the uh, ULX3. So he's using a 76, is it 76, 70? I always forget the number of these damn cameras. So like a 76, uh, 76 70 camera, which is basically a parallel port that's... Um, 7670, yeah, OVR 7670. It's basically parallel, so there's an 8 bit port D0, D7, and then there's some other signals as well, um, which is the, um, you have like a horizontal pixel, vertical pixel, and a pixel clock. Sorry, horizontal sync, vertical sync, and a pixel clock. Um, so on the alloy board, we have a, an FPC connector for attaching these and these, these can be had relatively low cost and there are different versions different numbered versions of as well um, and then the other thing we, that um, Laurie was interested in connecting up was uh, a 240 by 240 uh, LCD screen and this uses the um, you just get the number right it has a like a video driver built in uh, what's it called what's it called it's used in quite a few different LCDs actually um, ST7789 LCD yeah thanks Lai. I just think he's actually posted it um, and this can be driven this case got a weird set of pins actually if you look at the data sheet uh, I don't have it open here damn it um, if you look at the data sheet you can you can either drive this serially as if it's an SPI uh, the way it names its pins is a bit odd so you, you have an SDA pin which is actually serial in and out it's not I squared C um, then you provide a clock and a chip select you also need to provide a reset. Is there one more I'm missing? I forget. Um, or alternatively, you can drive it with a parallel, like an 8080 type parallel approach, which is uh, an 8 bit A0. Also a D DC pin. Yeah, the DC pin doubles up. Uh, that's That's data or command when it's in serial mode and I think <sighs> it's a bit complicated but the the parallel mode some of the pins change so you have a d0 to d7 for the parallel data then the dc pin I think becomes a, um, <clears throat> a clock pin uh, anyhow it's quite complicated if you look at the data sheet I mean, the waveforms, the timings of things aren't complicated. It's just it's the way that the pins change. Um, and there's normally on that chip that's built into the LCD or it actually on the flex, when we stuck to the flex connector, uh, has up to four configuration pins for all these various different modes that it supports. Um, but often they're not all exposed quite often you only get one or two of these pins exposed so in the i found a bunch of them on aliexpress and um in fact i've had several different vendors that have them and they had uh 
they only have one configuration pin uh, exposed, but it's connected, I think, to two, two of the configuration pins. The two connected together, but exposed as one pin. And that enables you to switch either between the SPI-like or serial or parallel. So I was looking at putting that on alloy. Uh, I don't know if I can. Um, this is driving me mad, actually, alloy, because um, but it's not alloy that's driving me mad. I like the alloy stuff. I like the software and the way I'm going with that. What's driving me mad is being confined to the feather pinout. It's doing my head in. Seriously doing my head in. Um, let me just get the CAD up and I'll show you. Uh, bear with me a sec. Let me open up. I can come back to this one. I've got amalgam open here. <laughs> Uh, let me see if I can just quickly uh, What's that weird going on there with the that a schematic? What's it doing? Where would we set? Oh, it's the library. Okay, yeah. there we go. Um, so let me just zoom in a bit on this. Bear with me. So you can see at this end. Um, so what I was thinking here is having this uh, FPC connector on the end. This FPC connector, I mean, there's one underneath already pointing in the other direction for the camera. Um, but having the uh, FPC on this end would enable us to connect up to the um, ST7789 or any ST, you know, driven. Any ST7789 LCD that's driven. But ideally something like a 240 by 240 display. Uh, Laurie's saying he's um, he's already done an NMIGEN driver for the SPI mode. It wouldn't be difficult to uh, change that, Laurie, to the parallel mode, to be honest. It's a really simple timing. Uh, it just ha you, you have to add a read and write pin. Um, so, uh, yeah. But, so, I was thinking that could go on the end here. Now, the advantage... Of going that route would be that you can actually um, by default you could depending on the pinouts I could expose the pins for expansion the FPGA pins for expansion through the header pins um, but keep back I think enough pins to control the serial so you've got a choice you can either expand the pin use you know, maybe on a daughter board or on the breadboard, or whatever, as normal. And it would still be able to drive the uh, display, albeit in SPI rather than parallel mode. Or if you want the high performance, you can actually uh, drive it in parallel mode. But obviously you're sacrificing more FPGA um, pins in order to do that. So it's kind of compromised, but you, you would have the choice to be able to do that was what I was thinking. So it was looking like a good thing to have on the board. And then I could offer the camera and the um, the LCDs as an option as well in a bundle and things, which might be useful for some people. But given how standard those are, they're fairly easy to pick up. Um, yeah, the pinout thing is really driving me mad. I hate having these here like this when it's a kind of breadboard. Uh, again, I was playing with the idea of tying some of the FPGA pins to these top pins here. So that I effectively got eight pins 
that replace the um, the normal feather pins, the ones that will be connected to the microcontroller. But there are all sorts of issues when you go down that route because um, one of the things I've been doing is working with the SPI stuff. So there's a lot of peripherals that work with SPI for the feather boards and things like that. Now, all of these expect to have things like I.O. controls for the CS because CS pin isn't done by the SPI driver. It's actually done separately. Uh, in order that work, um, it will, the driver will automatically pick up the pin that you pass in. Now, if those were FPGA pins, that's going to be a lot more difficult. And that kind of messes things up a little bit. So, yeah, I'm going backwards and forwards again as to where to put these pin expansions because I'm really not totally sold on having the pins like this so yeah I mean I don't want to dwell too much on the alloy stuff today because we did quite a bit of that um, last week so I've got some other things that I want to cover today but yeah I'm getting somewhat caught up and frustrated with the feather format basically and I'm not quite sure how I'm, how I'm going to get out of this because it's um, a big limitation uh, so one of the things that Laurie's saying here is that arrangement i.e. he's talking about what you can see on um, the CAD right now by having the FPC connector in there for the display we are also effectively taking away what was the um, the double P mod right angle connector that was on there before. That's right, Laurie. I can't see any way of doing both of those other than if we get rid of this here, have the P mod pointing that way, so in the same position as this here, so that the pins go in here. Let me show you. Actually, let me just pull one in and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, it is a possibility. Um, but we get back to that problem that I had before. Hold on, let me just find the um, appropriate part so that you can see. I'll just drag it straight on. I've had stuff on and off this so often anyhow, it's not going to make much difference. Uh, okay, let's put that one here. Let me go back. So, effectively, that would go here, and then we'd have to lose this. Is that let me um, take this out of the way for a moment? God, where is the bloody handle for this? Where did I just had it? Uh, there. Mm -hmm. So we'd have this kind of arrangement. Uh, we'd need to pull this in as well, so. Hold on, let's just do that. Uh, hmm. So you'd have something like that, effectively. So again, that's possible, but it still leaves me, um, these pins here won't be there like that. We'd have to change those around. Still leaves me with the problem of exposing the rest of the FPGA pins. Just is where I, you know, start losing it with the feather format because it's just, where'd you take them? 
there's just no room it's always just a big compromise whichever way I turn with the with this format and it's driving me nuts So that connector, by the way, the FPC connector is actually on the bottom for the display. If you hadn't worked that one out. So if anyone's got any ideas, let me know, because I am kind of pulling my hair out. So it is possible to have the P-Mod on there, sorry, and the FPC connector, which might be a nice compromise, but I've still got to add some more pins somewhere. I've got to expose some more pins. I mean, I could have kind of do four here. So let me see if I can find that. Uh, these won't be the right sort, but it will give you an idea where they'd sit. Uh, two by twos. So these could be on the bottom, but even there, it's. I don't think I'm going to be able to fit them in because they're they're going to clash with the P mod pins. They're just too close. No way of doing it. There's just not enough real estate on the board. It'll drive me crazy. Uh, anyhow, need to have some more thoughts on that. I don't want to dwell too much on it. If you have any good ideas how to get around that, let me know. Let me know your thoughts. Um, right, covering the other things, so, um, what else was I going to mention? Oh, uh, the avatar stuff. I've been trying to clean up some of those. Ed's been helping, uh, provide me with, uh, avatar icons to try and replace the broken ones. Uh, it's a slow job, I'm afraid. It is just very, very painful to do. You have to go and impersonate each of the users that has a missing one. And you have to go through this quite long step of things in order to change everything. And then you have to literally log out and log back in. And it's just annoying. But I've got through some of them. That's looking a bit better. Should be less broken um, avatars on the forum uh, for everyone. And um, thanks for Ed for his help with that, providing the, uh, what do they call those avatars, lettered avatars or whatever they call it. Um, oh, and I managed to ship out uh, a batch. Oh, that's all right, Ed. You're welcome. It looks better when I fix some of the avatars, mate. It's just I hate doing it because it's a pain in the ass and I've just got zero time. Um... It's just when I get five minutes every now and then I'll change and update for you, basically. Um, I managed to ship out a batch of Black Ice MX boards last week. All over the world, in fact. People, it all just came in from all over the world. It's quite amazing. Um, very diverse batch, that was. Uh, and then we sold out again. Uh, I've just added another smaller batch in. Uh, and they're going quite quickly as well. So um, if, if, you, if you need to get one, grab that that quickly, obviously. Um, I will be doing some more batches, but probably not for a good few weeks. Um, the trouble is, is getting the, um, the P-Mod parts um, soldered up. It's extremely time consuming, unfortunately. And I'm really time poor on that front. Um, so that's the Black Ice MX ones. Uh, 
Okay, so the conversational thing that I wanted to cover today, uh, if we get time later as well, we'll also look at the uh, Amalgam stuff, which is the next gen black edge board that has ESP5 on it. I need to do some work on that. Uh, I'm being hassled by um, by Toby in the factory in, in Shenzhen because um, they're storing all the components uh, and they get a bit arsy looking after stuff if you don't actually build anything with them for a while. And I haven't built any more boards, any new boards for, well, a long time. And they've just been sitting on the components. Um, and they have to store them properly, etc. in, you know, moisture-free areas at the right temperature and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I need to do some more on that and get that out. Um, there's some good questions around that. But before that, what I wanted to cover was um, connectivity. Um, one of my favourite subjects. <laughs> I've had lots of fun with this in the past. So, um, last was it last week? I think it was last week. Um, Spark Fun announced something called the uh, Micro Mod. Let me give you a link. Hold on. Let me just um, also. That's done here. Yeah. Back to this. Um, Spark from Micromods. Micro. Um, so, um, SparkFun announced this new standard, oh, MicroMod. Um, there was a forum post on it as well, which you can contribute to if you're interested. Hold on, let me just find that once on it. Uh, this one. Um, the key thing with this, I wonder if I can get my browser up and then you can see some of this talk, hold on, let's just kill, can I get this up? Okay, so this is the uh, micro mod uh, from SparkFun. So if you look here, let me scroll down, give you a closer up view. So if we look at one of the, so the, the standard comprises of two things. One is the uh, carrier board, which you can see an example here. Damn it, when it go any bigger than this? Hold on. Trying to get it as big as I can, folks. So on here, this the, the key thing here. So th this is a carrier board. And this connector here is, uh, people refer to this as the M.2 connector. So this is... The same, it comes in a couple of different variants. Um, if you look carefully here, we've got pins, 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 and then a gap, then pins, pins. So, so the gap is the key. That's actually closed. So it stops you put, for the board to fit in, <clears throat> it has to be keyed, has to have a piece cut out of it. And where that key is varies. There are different types of, or different variants of this connector effectively. 
with different keyings for different things. And this is used in um, inside laptops, for example, for adding Wi-Fi, for adding SSD storage, among other things. Uh, and people have looked to try and use this connector because it's relatively low cost, high density. They've looked to reuse this or repurpose this connector in order to use it for things like microcontrollers. So that's a bit different from its original um, original specification. And, and the standard is is enumerated quite quite carefully, uh, albeit for different keys and different approaches and stuff. Um, but what you're doing compared to the original M2 standard is you're flipping, you know, normally the laptop was the host, and then this would be a peripheral device. But in this kind of usage, what you're talking about is you have the host board, you know, your microprocessor board, your core board, if you like, is a board that goes in, and then the thing that's connected to the connector the, is a carrier board. So that's the peripheral or peripherals. So it's it's inverted. It turns it uh, turns the standard round. Um, it, it's also a high speed connector. So on the original design, the M2 design, it does have PCIe. I think is it 2.0. I don't know if it has 3.0. PCIe, but it has several lanes of PCIe 2, I think. So it's actually a high-speed connector, so it's actually quite cool. But most of the, um, <clears throat> not all, but most of the reuses, uh, a lot of them won't support uh, high-speed design, which is a bit of a shame. Um, <clears throat> and also, unfortunately, let me just show you something else. Um, God, I've got to find it now. Right. So um, basically, SparkFun said, oh, we're going to do this new standard. We're going to call it Micromod. And there's a little core card that goes in. And they've got various carrier boards. I think they offer like three different core cards and three different carrier boards. And then they want to create an ecosystem. They want the open source community to um, build stuff. Um, but the thing is, they're not the first people to do this. People have been trying to reuse these connectors for a while. Uh, so there was quite an interesting response to this. Um, so one, one of the areas, um, Phil Tyrone started uh, a little um, repo on GitHub to talk about this. Um, because... If you look here, here are some of the examples of people that have already done this, reuse this standard. Uh, this is the, um, oh, what do you call it? Uh, Maker Diary board. Uh, that's been used as a processor for keyboards, among other things. Uh, this is the particle. I think there's a couple of different particles, actually, which is like a... Uh, kind of a IOT module. Uh, this is one of the SparkFone Spark modules. This is the Artemis, which is there, which is like an STM, is it an STM32 with Wi-Fi? Oh, sorry, it's an M4 with Wi-Fi. I'm not sure if it's an STM32. Um, so that's one of their uh, new Micromod cores. They don't call them cores, actually. They call them something else. 
This one's uh, a board from Google, which is like uh, for machine learning, speeding up machine learning. Uh, this one is from, I don't know how to pronounce this. This is Cypede, 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 uh, which is the um, one of the Chinese manufacturers. Uh, then on the left hand side you've got something from snaps uh, and this uses really few small amount of pins funny you know and then this one is the like uh, a WRT so it's like a cut down Linux for Wi-Fi type board IOT board so as you can see there's a good variety of things out there prior to spark announcing uh, their board um, which is why, you know, well, Tyrone's, Philip Tyrone's uh, idea was to, you know, is there some way we can standardize this because it's all such a mess. Um, so one of the things that I kicked off on here, uh, I mean, we talked about it on, on the MyStorm forum, so I put a link in for that, talking about it from the FPGA point of view. Um, but under the standards discussion, I also um, figured, well, just getting a grip, that's the official uh, module key, E. So it's, this is actually a E key. Where that gap is, fits the M2 key, E. Um, yeah, no problem, Ed. Uh, if you get back on, good. Um, so what I did on here was uh, I thought crikey to get some visibility on this um, I created a, a, a spreadsheet because it was really really difficult to hmm, go away hmm I'm going to make this bit smaller, folks. Well, still not small enough to fit on the screen. Hmm. Can I go down to 30? Ah, no, let me do 30. Is that as small as it goes? Really? 30. Oh, fair enough. So anyhow, it, so across the top here, I've got uh, the, the M2.com is a standard, by the way. Um, it's an IoT standard for repurposing the M2 uh, bus. Uh, there's a Google Card, Particle, Maker Diary, MicroMod, Cypede, and WRT. Uh, I don't have the snaps one on here, but if you look here, so these are the pin numbers. It goes right up to, it's like a 75 pin connector here. So if you look at what everybody's doing, some of them aren't using E, they're using the B slot. Those two on the end, the Cypede and the WRT. But the ones that are using the E key, <sighs> God, that's annoying. Go away. So the ones that are using the E key, here are completely and utterly different in terms of their pinout where the power pins are there's a few commonalities like the usb that you could pick out and some of the ios but a lot of it is contradictory the green ones here are mixed signals by the way and then the purple ones are high speed signals so the whole thing is an incredible incredible mix up um, straight away so I don't have no idea how the hell this is ever going to get uh, resolved um, the conversations are ongoing on that forum but um, Sorting this out is difficult. I mean, the advantage of sorting it out is you could have a standard 
for core and carrier boards, right? You can, that would be extremely powerful in the open source community to have that. Um, they would be remarkably useful. But um, these, these organizations just haven't attempted to go out and consult the community at all about how to do things, um, which is rather disappointing. Uh, I just get a feeling it might turn into just a big bun fight in the end if we're not careful, and it won't be any use to anyone. You'll just end up with proprietary cores and proprietary carriers. Um, we, we, we were discussing, could we implement something like the micro mod? So that's this one. Um, so if we look down at this, it's a bit difficult because there's only two officially ADC pins. Um, which is a bit bonkers. There's also two dedicated PWM pins, PWM0 and PWM1, and two dedicated D0 and D1s, I think, as well. I can't see that. Where are those gone? There. D0. I mean, it's kind of all over the place. Um, and then they dedicate other functions like can receive and can transmit. Um, they do TX and RX, which is fair enough. You'd expect them to do that. You know, SCL and STA for I squared C kind of makes sense. And having an SPI, that kind of makes sense as well. But they also start committing to things like these audio things, which is a bit more debatable. And then the, the green ones on here, they talk about them. Well, in, in the first document, they don't say anything about being able to use these for analog. They only say that you can use these as GPIO pins or as a bus. And I presume like an 8-bit bus because they don't actually specify any standard to the bus. They don't say use like the 8080 or use an I2C 8-bit type arrangement. They've not referred to any standard. But then, then it, they go on to kind of say, oh, some of these can be PWM or ADC. But they're not specific about that. So that becomes a bit kind of unspecified so you've got these specified pins that are then unspecified so it's and when we looked at it certainly down on the form we couldn't find an easy way how, how would i you know how would i take something like a black edge board for example and put that into you know like black ice mx how would i convert that to be able to fit into one of these m2 um M2 connectors if I followed something like the Micromod standard and it just it just didn't add up really um, it's not just their standard the other standards were you know some of the other standards were a bit daft as well but they did tend to be a bit a bit more general which was a bit more flexible um, so yeah this is an interesting area. I mean, it's very difficult to do standard pinouts. But I think the minimum you should do is actually consult with your community before you do it. Because if nothing else, you know, you, with a large community, people will immediately pull up some of the issues before you actually go and make some boards and reinforce those issues, which is what they've done. So um, this this difficult the M2 format, although it looks kind of attractive, um, I don't quite know how we'd get to a standard on it. 
can be used generally. I mean, you do get occasionally these kind of de facto standards, don't you? Whereby a manufacturer, you know, uh, ends up to do dominating and then dictating. But I can't, I don't see any of these folks being able to do that, quite frankly. So, um, it's a bit of a shame, really, because it would be interesting to play along and build some boards and put some FPGA uh, and micros into these to represent, um, you know, the stuff that we're working on. Um, I think it would be tricky to do what we're doing with Black Edge with it because there's not quite enough pins there. Although, you know, we could we could compromise on that. Um, so, to some degree, it may be better for a kind of alloy type product rather than a black edge one, possibly. I mean, interestingly, when I was working, you know, trying to work out what we were going to do for black edge, and when I was discussing with everyone down on the forums which way we could go when we were going through the different types of connectors and stuff. Um, earlier on, I had considered the M2, uh, but rejected it prim primarily because there wasn't enough pins for what everyone wanted to do at the time. Oh, visited by Sparkle. Come on, Sparks, up here. Yeah, coming up. Where are you being? So, um, yeah. So what's that saying here? Alpha testing and beta testing is so important to uh, get design errors out as well as implementation. Indeed. But more importantly, you know, if you've got a bunch of people that know what they're talking about, and that's what our forums are full of, that's what our communities are full of, Put the idea in front of them first. They will spot things straight away that are issues. You know, consult with, you know, this wealth of uh, skill that you've got in your communities and stuff. Don't just like dartboard something and then announce that that's the way of it's going to be. Um, they will just come back and bite you. That's the trouble. So I wanted to uh, talk about that because it's uh, an interesting area. Um, currently with Black Edge, we've got uh, two lots of 50 pins. So we've actually got 100 pins. So we've got another third on top of what an M2 would provide us with. And it's spread over two connectors. So it's a more balanced connection. Uh, so from a vibration point of view or mechanical point of view, it's more solid, it's more rigorous. Um, the other thing, it's a lot easier to solder. Trying to solder an M2 um, is, is pretty tricky, actually. They're fairly close together, the pins. Um, so if somebody just wanted to make their own, like, proto carry or whatever it's going to be um, quite difficult um, the other thing is the form factor so if I go back to um, here hold on so that's a carrier so if you look at one of the boards that goes on that let's look at the uh, what's this it's an ESPS2 version for example so if I look at that, can I? Damn it. So if you look at that, it's actually pretty damn tiny. It's the, the Micromod from SparkFun. The specification is like um, 22 mil by 22 mil. But because you've got this cutout as well, you end up with a lot less than 22 mil in terms of rectangular space. 
so it's pretty damn tight so in most cases when 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 they've done this they, they use double-sided boards um i'm a bit surprised about that and the boards are very thin they're like uh 0 0.8 mil thick which is quite thin but i think that's an m2 thing because you've only got a 0.9 mil space between the contacts and then you've got 0.1 sprung well a bit more than 0.1 um but yeah these are quite tiny as well um and the way that they've seen this is different from the way that i kind of or the way that we worked out black edge so i mean one of the things that was important with black edge not only do you need quite a lot of connectors but what you want to try and do where possible is keep as much of the high speed stuff on the core board itself so it doesn't have to travel fast uh, and use the standard connectors associated with that so for example if you had a USB 3 then you probably wouldn't want to run that over your connector uh, you probably want it on the board if you've got HDMI uh, it's the same thing or e-display you want to do the same thing you don't really want to be running those down over the connector you have all sorts of uh, impedance problems uh, and routing problems as well because you need the room to route those kind of signals you have to avoid crossing over other signals etc to get the impedance right you also have to worry about impedance matching your networks you know on the PCB tracks and on the layers and you have limited numbers of layers in that kind of thickness so yeah some of those choices are a bit strange um, at least with black edge we've got the high speed connectors uh, actually on the board itself but on here there's no way you could fit those in you can't put them on the side because you have to leave the room for the side because of the way the standards done it has to be that width but you could have made it longer but then you've got this cut out for the screw so you've actually got no room there and you're meant to leave a certain space at the top for um for the rf side of things you know the wi-fi and the bluetooth that also sits above the board it's very very actually very close to the board so that's could adversely affect your um, wireless parts of the standard as well so this is a little bit odd and very confined the way that they've done it um, which surprises me as well I don't they didn't have to make it this small um, you know and you could have because they're changing this this screw in you do need to screw in because the way the connector works it, it works on a lever so it has to be pulled down that actually reduces the insertion uh cycles oh, sorry it improves the insertion cycles because there's less scratching because what happens is you put it in and then pull it down screw it down and that makes good contact um but you could have done that on the corners two on the corner that would have been good then you would have left the middle but at least you know then you could fit in you know a mini HDMI or USB-C or those kind of things in fact you could put two USB-C's and that would cover you for your high speed USB's and it will cover you for your you know uh, digital video standards as well so and you could have made it longer giving yourself a bit more room why squash it all up into something as small as that I mean it's just it just seems unnecessary to me so yeah uh, and most people have already come up with these criticisms etc you know we're not the only people to have said these things about it others have as well they're fairly obvious constraints um, so yeah it's a bit of a shame really I think I was just hoping that someone would do something bit more open as a standard and talk to the community but um, spark fun just didn't seem to want to do that and now of course uh, with 
with Phil suggesting that that's what happens next. Um, it's actually quite a difficult situation because some people are now saying, oh, well, Adafruit are only doing this because Spark Fun have done that. You know, isn't this predatory, you know, jumping on their standard, telling them how bad their standard is or it should be open, etc. Well, yeah, I can see why people might think that. But an open standard would be better. However, how will they open it and get everyone to agree is another thing. It would be fantastic if everyone can, and then we'd have something usable. If you go back to the original um, documents, you you weren't confined on size as well. So if you look at the original M2, you normally have um, options on the size. Let's see if I can find this here. Uh, oh, it's because I've got the spreadsheet open. It's on here. There. So that's the official M2 standard. It's not nearly as confined. And I mean, you could have chosen any different kind of uh, connector here. It could have been wider, for example, like this. You know, or it could be wider and longer. You know, you didn't have to confine yourself to that. Uh, you know, a 30 by 42 gives you bags more room than the 22 by 22. In fact, there isn't a 22 by 22 one here. Yeah, that's the odd thing. So I don't know where they got that size from. Dartboard like, I suppose. Um... I mean, if we could come up with a standard, would anyone think that's a good idea, like an M2? So if they come up with a standard that is possible for us to do, you know, would that be better than Black Edge? I'd like to know your thoughts on that. I mean, uh, one of Laurie's comments was it's not very FPGA when he looked at the connector pinouts. Um, but if, but if there was something a bit more um, flexible, you know, would it be better to go with something like an M2 design? A more generous M2 design in terms of size and better pinouts. Would that be better than going with something like a black edge? What do you think? Did you see this, Ed, by the way? I mean, there's plenty of discussions on this. I mean, the difference between the WRT board and the Spark Fund is just enormous. Look at the size difference between those two. A lot more room on here. No, I agree, Laurie. You know, if there isn't an open standard, it's very very difficult to justify going down that road. Anyhow, let me know your thoughts on that. Um, so I was going to Spend some time looking at. Um, are there any questions before I move on or comments on the M2? Um, on the M2 discussion conversation. By the way, I think if we were going to use a, you know, an M2 thing, it's probably probably not black edge territory. It's more alloy te territory given the number of pins involved being smaller and the fact we'd have to compromise anyhow if there was a standard there'd probably be less pins that we could use effectively um, so it'd be more alloy like in its nature than black edge like when i say alloy i mean like you know smaller 
I mean, fitting it on the board would be difficult, actually, unless the board was a bit bigger. Um, so the other thing I was going to cover today, uh, if there's no more on that, is I just wanted to um, switch over to the... Um, the amalgam so let me do that um, let me switch the display so that we can all see what's going on there uh, turn that off for a sec So this is how the amalgam currently looks. So let me just talk through where we are. So amalgam, for those that don't recognize the name, I had to give it a name for the new um, the repository, uh, which is, by the way, sorry, I do apologize, is out of date. I know Laurie was looking at it today saying, which one's amalgam? And when he looked at it, the PDF, the circuit diagram, only has one part. It's actually like five pages of schematics it's not just one page but for some reason when it outputted the um, PDF it only output the first page which is annoying so that's what's in the repo at the moment on github I do apologize I did post an older version that had more than one page but this is currently undergoing some quite significant changes at the moment but um, for those of you that can recollect from last year when I first talked about Black Edge, this, this, this had been sitting on the cards and had been put on hold due to other projects that I was involved in at the time that meant I didn't have time to get this done. And I've subsequently had some changes of heart in terms of the way I wanted it done. Um, but it was based on the, I think we called it the E5 then, but basically it's based around the ECP5. Uh, so let's just do a quick refresh of what that is. Um, because some of you probably don't or aren't familiar with that. Let's just do a quick overview. And you can see what I'm actually talking about. So let me just get that to the forefront. Uh, so uh, again, it's a lattice chip, um, just like the ICE 40 range is a uh, lattice chip. Um, but this was actually developed by Lattice themselves, whereas the Ice 40 stuff actually came from another company that Lattice acquired called Silicon Blue, I think it was, or something like that. I have blue in the name somewhere. If anyone remembers, post it. Um, so the ECP5 and ECP5G, 5 5G, G, um, is an interesting. Uh, FPGA family. Uh, let me bring up some features here. That's probably best. It might be difficult to read. I do apologize. Um, but uh, it comes in, uh, in terms of capacity, again, it uses small lookup tables. It's not like the Xilinx uh, 6 bit lookup tables, it uses 4 bit lookup tables. Uh, it comes in, well, Actually, has they got this here? Yeah. So it comes in 12,000 12, lookup tables, 25,000 lookup tables, 45,000 lookup tables. And in certain chip packages, you can also even get it in an 85,000 lookup table variant. Uh, in addition to those nice uh, selection of um, 
look up table densities you get some quite generous features such as uh, the embedded RAM um, brrr, uh, K bit so if we look at the embedded memory here that goes up to uh, 3.7 megabits um, which is quite generous uh, there's also some distributed RAM bits in there as well um, up to about half half a megabit uh, it also has some multipliers and again these are more generous than the ICE 40 5k in this sense you get more multipliers in here than you would in there and on some of the chips it also has SIRDIS options and it does a 3G and a 5G version and the 5G version literally enables you to do with the right firmware you could actually do 5G and e-displays and all that kind of stuff which is kind of cool uh, and you get a bunch of PLLs and DLLs and the DLLs are for things like uh, DDR RAM and DDR MIPI type communications and stuff so they those those DLLs are on the edges you know they're not like internal PLLs they actually work on the edges on the IO sections so that you can do your double data rate clocking which is kind of nice so they're a pretty serious contender really in terms of FPGA I mean they're not big Xilinx they're not Vertex or Artex but they are somewhere in between you know the kind of ice 40 which are very small relatively low speed so these are kind of a medium speed if you like um, medium density rather than a higher density so they're great chips um, in terms of package availability as well uh, they're only available in BGA so there are no TQFP packages or QFM packages they're only available in um, in uh, BGAs of various different sizes Laurie's telling me um, you can do most retro computers just using the on-chip RAM yeah because the on-chip RAM is more generous certainly on the larger uh, capacity vcp 5s you can do everything on chip which is great because that's a real pain having to use external SD RAM or, SD, or, or even um, DDR RAM you don't have to worry about that you can actually just use the internal resources because the amount the number of resources you need in terms of memory it's um, relatively small for the retro stuff so it's great for that kind of work um, Laurie's also saying Saxon sock which is based around the um, spinal HDL um, running Linux because I think they've done an MMU and stuff for this now and uh, correct me if I'm wrong Lloyd but uh, he's saying that runs about 50 megahertz I know it's not very fast but don't forget you're talking about an entire Linux system you know inside an FPGA it runs a four CPU system so is that four Saxon socks running at 50 megahertz is that effectively what it is four cores which is pretty powerful inside uh, an FPGA. I bet it gets hot, doesn't it, Laurie? <laughs> that would be my guess. Um, so yeah, um, yeah. Try putting your finger on it, Laurie, when it's running something strenuous. I'd be intrigued to know uh, so in terms of the packages there's a 381 uh, very generously spaced FPGA um, BGA package which is quite large 17 by 17 mil 
these are 0.8 millimeter spacing so it's very generous so you think about most um uh like qfn's they're either 0.5 or 0.4 mil spacing but the ball spacing on these is really actually quite wide at uh you know at 0.8 mil uh, what that means is you can get lines in between them with relatively inexpensive PCBs. You don't have to go to these mad PCB specs that are very expensive in order to break out the balls. However, um, I mean, on 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 the design that um, <coughs> excuse me, design that we we're working with um, for uh, the amalgam. Uh, we we're not using the 381. We're using the 256. Why doesn't it list the 256 there? Did I scroll past that? Yeah, there is a 256 here. Look, we're using the 256 pin ball, should I say? But again, it's 0 0.8 mil spacing, and you get some uh, IOs for your money as well. You know, 197 IOs. Incredible. Where'd you put them all? Which is another reason why you need good connectivity. You don't want to be throwing too much of that away. Some of it, you the high-speed stuff, you want to confine to the board. And I'll, I'll come to that when I talk about the cab. So it's a pretty good solution. And unbelievably, these go up to... There is a 756 ball version, which is just outrageous number of I.O. connectors. Um... Yeah, quite a bit of routing involved on that. So that's the chip. So let's get back to... Um, oh, and the other thing is, uh, fairly importantly, uh, uh, the ECP5 uh, range is supported by the open source tool chain. Uh, and David Shah helped, you know, fuzz that to get support, and that's that's actually supported by the next PNR place and root, next place and root uh, open source library, um, which is the other important reason why we've chosen it. So uh, let's get back to the CAD if we can. So if we look at the current board design, and this is undergoing significant amount of change, I warn you, um, what would you expect to see on the board? So let, let, let's just go round, I guess, first. So uh, on the board itself, here I've got the mini HDMI connector, which I promised to do correctly this time. If I stick to that, I'd really like to go to a slightly bigger one, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to squeeze it in. See, I could take the second USB out and maybe squeeze a bigger HDMI connector in. Um, and that's a possibility. Or just stick with a smaller one. I can also put connectors underneath on here, because don't forget this is going to be a double-sided board. You don't have any choice with the BGAs, because you have to put your decoupling underneath the chip underneath the balls uh, plus we've got connectors under the board anyhow for the uh, black edge which I'll come to in a bit so there's potentially another USB on the left hand side here are you, oh, you're not seeing my cursor hold on there you go sorry HDMI is at the top left here that I was just talking about below this is a secondary USB connection that we may or may not have I may just put something like the FPC connector here for the camera. That's this one. At the moment, that's showing vertically. I may make this horizontal. Okay, here. Uh, that is MIPI based, CSI based. That uses differential signaling. So that's not like the one we're using with Alloy, which is a parallel. Uh, this will be based around effectively four differential high-speed uh, links.
extra USB connected to the FPGA pins, extremely useful. Yeah, point taken. But is that okay as no TG connector? Um, because you can always take these pins down through the uh, connector uh, and put proper host A's and stuff on any carrier board. But anyhow, yeah, I, I, I could keep it there. Possibly the only disadvantage is you get a vertical uh, camera FPC connector rather than a horizontal one. Uh, which is a bit annoying. Uh, so going around, uh, I'm going anti-clockwise for some strange reason. We've got some LEDs here. Then we've got the main communication stroke uh, sharing USB connector. Saxon Sock is currently getting USB host support, says Laurie. Well, that's cool. That's good. That's handy. So this USB connector here is connected to the microcontroller, which is this large 100-pin TQFP type package. I'll come back to what that is a bit later. So that's the main mechanism for uploading uh, our bit files and stuff to program the uh, FPGA. Then along the bottom here, we've got some buttons. I've got six buttons marked on here. Two of these are for control purposes, like a boot and a mode button. And then there's four user buttons. I don't think we need four. It's probably going to go down to two. There's not really much purpose in having too many here. Uh, but don't forget, we are I.O. rich on this. Um, however, I'd like to expose as many of those I.O.s down Black Edge as is humanly possible. They can be used for other nefarious processes and requirements. Okay, so this is, this is interesting. And I will circle back round to this, Laurie. But just, just so you see what Laurie said, he said, I personally prefer the ESP32 running MicroPython. Ugh. MicroPython, not MicroPython. Um, he'd prefer to see the ESP32 running MicroPython instead of the STM32 host. Let me circle back round to that because it's an, it's an important point, um, Laurie. That's one of the things that we need to discuss, including your second comment, which is or circuit Python. So uh, just moving our way around. So I'd probably lose a few of those buttons because we don't need that many buttons on the board. You can't get to them anyhow. They're better off in the carrier. But it's nice to have at least one or whatever just for doing simple test stuff. Then we've got some power regulators here. These are switch modes. Um, you'll be familiar with these. We've used these before. They're very reliable. We use these on the Black Ice MX. In between there, you've got two um, two flash chips. Sorry, you've got one flash RAM, SPI flash RAM connected to the STM32, and then you've got a flash ROM uh, also. <clears throat> Alternatively, that may be able to be connected to the um, FPGA. And again, we can circle back to that one. But the uh, the ROM that we would use, the flash, would probably be one of the larger ones. Um, I was thinking of maybe using the biggest one we can find, which is like 128 megabit what's that eight megabyte um, which is kind of useful and then moving up around here we've got another connector here this is a this is a MIPI based output that enables us to drive displays LCD displays use high speed L MIPI diffs and it will do low bandwidth and high bandwidth so we have to double up on the pins. It's very wasteful. I don't mind doing it once. I'm not doing it for both both sides. The camera side is just not like that. But the display side is good. That enables us to support uh, slightly larger format displays. 
which is kind of cool. SPI flash connected to the FPGA is very useful. Saxon Sock uses it. Sure. I mean, I could even put three different SPI uh, chips on here. One flash and two ROMs. One ROM for the FPGA, one ROM for the uh, microcontroller. Um, I don't know, how, how large does it need to be, Laurie? Um, then moving around up to the top left hand side here we have um, some DDR RAM um, and I might offer that in different sizes um, to be confirmed in terms of the size but uh, yeah it needs to be reasonably large um, at least, uh, you know, 32 meg or something like that, upwards. And then we're back around to the top and we have the other connector. So the black edge connectors you see are at the bottom, on the bottom of the board, at the bottom of this diagram. And at the top of the board, on the bottom of the board, um, here just like Black Ice MX. So you only need a small flash for that because they're very low cost, these flash chips. Uh, they're not difficult to squeeze in. Um, I could give it its own. Um, it, it's not SD RAM, it's DDR RAM. Lorry. And it's 32 upwards would be my guess it's not been decided yet <clears throat> so let's talk about <coughs> the processor um, so what I was envisaging certainly originally with this and more recently the this chip here Uh, there are going to be choices, Laurie, on the memory size. I might do more than one version of this for different size memories, is the answer. So this, th this uh, chip, which is <sighs> acts as the interface to the FPGA, effectively. Uh, in this case, it's an STM32, uh, and it can be an F4H7. Probably a H7. Although, again, it could be an option to have an F7. Because uh, I can match the pinouts. Why would I use that? Well, the F7 is pretty powerful. Um, but one of the features that I'm using here. Uh, something that you can't do with the ESP S2, sorry, 32 S2, sorry, is um, you, you're kind of limited to SPI and Quad SPI as an interface, maybe Octo SPI if they ever get that damn thing working. But on here, uh, let me just show you what we're talking about doing is we have a, uh, we're using the external memory interface which is a minimum 16 bit we could probably go up to 23 bits uh, I'm not sure if it's worth going up to 23 bits uh, but it would certainly be at least 16 bits so what does that mean that means that you've got a 16 bit highway effectively between the STM32 and the uh, ECP5 so on every clock cycle, and I think you can run this about 130-odd megahertz. So you'd be talking about 266 megabytes per second bandwidth between the STM32 and the ECP5, 
which is uh, fairly handy. Program the STM32 is a problem. The iScore version never really got finished. I don't like using the STM32. How? Says Ruffin. Well, the thinking was, uh, and I kind of agree, maybe, you know, I'm more used to the how because I have to use it for all sorts of projects and contracts and stuff. So I'm quite used to it. But um, in this case, what I was actually thinking of doing is running circuit Python uh, on this. So just like you have circuit Python running on the um, ESP32 S2 on alloy, you'd have circuit Python doing exactly the same sort of thing on the STM32. So you'd get with that all the libraries. Um, the difference here is that the bus between the STM32 and the um, ESP5 is you've got this external memory interface connection. Um, the other thing that that gives you is memory mapping. So that would enable us to directly memory map all the ECP5 memory and registers that we need uh, over a 16-bit bus effectively which is fairly rapid. Um, Laurie points out here that that would be good, but you lose Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Quite right. However, those are fairly easy to add in. Um, then you're into a territory of how do we do that. So let, let's spin back to that in a bit, Laurie, how we solve that problem. Uh, in the interim, the other problem we've got, just there is some technical detail here that you may or may not be aware of. The way that CircuitPython works is it has some very big libraries that are literally requirements. It's useless without them. Uh, that normally means you need some good size read-only memory to store that stuff into and then it gets pulled into RAM as it's running. So in order to help support that, just like you do on the ESP32, what you do is you add in a large ROM, or sorry, a large flash externally and a large, uh, if you want, a quad SPI, you know, so quad SPI flash and quad SPI RAM. And we could do the same thing uh, with the STM32 here. Um, the reason that you can do that and it works quite well is because inside the ESP32 S2 it's got a data and instruction cache. Likewise the STM32 that I'm talking about here, the H7 and even the F7, has an internal instruction and date, separate data cache as well. So they get the same benefits. And because that quad SPI can memory map that RAM, it makes it easier to actually build that in uh, to circuit Python. Um, some of the advantages also that you get is, so if we go with the H7 version of this, we get a megabyte of SRAM, which is very fast in the STM32 with the ESP32 S2, you don't get that. I think there's only like 320k of SRAM and it's not as fast. And don't forget that this H7 will run at 480 megahertz, which is twice the speed of the ESP S2, which only runs at 240, and that's its max. It doesn't always run at that speed. So in terms of performance, uh, the STM32 I'm talking about here is much more performance. Uh, has better memory characteristics and it has better processing characteristics. Not only that, it has floating point units as well, which the ESP32 does not have. The extensor does not have floating point support. Um, the disadvantage, as Laurie pointed out, is you don't get uh, Wi-Fi 
on the ESP 32S2, you don't get Bluetooth either, as well, by the way. So on Alloy, there's no Bluetooth, there's only Wi Fi, just in case you weren't aware of that. It's different from the ESP32. The ESP S2 is slightly different in that sense. So the difference between this and Alloy, or between the SDM32 and the ESP32, is you don't get Wi Fi. However, adding Wi Fi is actually very simple. You can just add either the ESP S2 chip itself, you can add an ESP8266 chip, or you can add a module. And we could either put that on the board itself or it can be added on the carrier. Uh, what's more, the uh, CircuitPython libraries support this mechanism and use SPI as the connection mechanism. Uh, and in fact, the API for both of the networking libraries for uh, CircuitPython is the same. Uh, because they have their airlift versions uh, which use SPI connected uh, Wi Fi and BLE. So we could quite easily add something here, either the chip or the module, that is really just adding in the Wi Fi and the Bluetooth. Sorry, let me just check my messages a sec. Thanks. I just need to keep an eye on something. Um, that would be great if you could fit all of that, Laurie says. What do you mean, fit in the Wi-Fi actually on the amalgam board? I mean, it could be an option. We'd have to rearrange things just slightly to fit it in. I mean, putting, putting a chip in is the simplest because it takes the least room, but it requires more components. Um, if you go the module route, then it could be an option. That's the other possibility. Uh, that would take up quite a bit of room there if you use the actual... Um, module i don't think i've got the library let's have a look at the simplest thing um uh, hmm So the simplest example would be something like um, an 8266 which would give us the um, this thing. What we'd have to do in this case is put it somewhere like that, maybe underneath. Hold on, let me just reverse this. So that could go underneath here, for example. That's a possibility. It wouldn't be difficult to add that in as an option. Not everyone would necessarily want that, Laurie, so Offering it as an option might be uh, a way to do that, as long as the uh, the ability to include it was added. You can actually solder these in quite easily, but um, yeah, I'd probably want to juggle things around a bit. That would solve the uh, issue of not having the um, Wi-Fi slash 
um, Bluetooth capability. I'm not sure how important that is for everyone, but it's becoming more important. Programming everything over Wi-Fi is extremely useful. Right. How does that help? Aren't they all, isn't it always connected to your um, computer when you're working on it anyhow? Or what, what, what's the benefit? I mean, obviously, it's not difficult to do that. We've got the Wi-Fi libraries. And it's certainly a solvable problem. It's not always connected to the computer, is what Laurie's saying. Sure, well in that case then, yeah, the Wi-Fi is useful to have, right? The only thing you'd have to worry about is, if you have it on this side, is you'd have to think about where this, you know, black edge core board is going to fit onto the carrier. Uh, clearly this edge here is likely to be on the edge of the carrier because you need access to the uh, you know the external connectors the USB etc but the other side here might not be in a nice place on the carrier right um, You'd have to be careful about how you design the carrier to make sure that nothing stood up here, for example. Um, uh, and I don't know if you could get it the other side. If you took that extra USB out, uh, could you squeeze it in here? I mean, you could put it under the uh, the connectors here, but I didn't want to do that for two reasons. One is that's kind of awkward, and then you've got all the cables coming out on this side, hanging in the way of the Wi-Fi receptacle, the the antenna. So that's not going to be particularly useful. Not only that, but underneath here, we've actually got something else as well, which is the uh, SD card which I'd like, uh, in this case, to have on the same side, if possible, as the USB connectors. Uh, I mean, it was okay on Black Ice MX, and on Ice, sorry, on Ice Core, having it at the other side, because it didn't actually jut out to interfere with anything, but it would have been nicer to have it on this side. So, um, if we can have the SD connector on that side, that'd be good. I guess it might be possible to have it alongside, or well, you could have it. Hmm. Could we have it there? Could have it underneath the uh, HDMI. It's going to be tricky because those pins go through on the HDMI connector. Also, it's a high-speed connector sitting right above the Wi-Fi stuff. That's not such a good idea. Um, The other possibility is you don't go with the uh, module, but you actually put the chip on the board with a ceramic an antenna. That way you're not jutting out. Uh, if you were to lose that USB connection, for example, you could put your Wi-Fi uh, antenna or Bluetooth antenna in here. another possibility or you could squeeze these USBs together and leave enough space here for the Wi-Fi antenna one of the more vertical ones it's a possibility but then you'd also have to somehow cram in the um, 
chip so that would be let me just do that so say we were to use something like a, an s2 or an esp32 uh that would be something of these sort of dimensions that could fit in here possibly and then the antenna could fit here that will work you don't need many connections going to it you just need SPI really I mean you could could do quad SPI if you wanted uh, Although the library, the circuit Python communications library that uses the the sockets library uses SPI, not quad SPI, but as far as I'm aware. <clears throat> so it's certainly a possibility. Uh, and they are doing, Expressive are doing quite a few different chips, strangely. Um, so you can actually get a chip that has the flash built in as well. So you don't need to add external flash, particularly if you're just using it for its Wi-Fi uh, rather than its I.O. capabilities entirely possible uh, depending on quantity the uh, cost is quite small um, depending on which chip you go for really if you want to go for one with the flash included I think it's like a dollar fifty or something something of that order Um, but if you go for the chip, then it has to be configured. It has to be on the board, unlike the module, which can be post added quite simply. If you're going for the chip with a ceramic antenna, uh, that needs to be done at the pick and place manufacturer. Um, so it has to be on all the boards really i mean you could make a certain number of with and without but trying to predict which ones you want with and without would be um fairly tricky um it does also give you a bit of a dilemma in terms of wow you know we've <laughs> potentially got three processors or four processors now on the board you've obviously got you know the processor inside the expressive plus they sometimes have an internal uh, processor for dedicated processor for doing the um, uh, Wi-Fi parts of that but uh, you've got the STM processor as well and then you've got potentially any processor soft processor running in the um, MyStorm However, in this case, the you know the extensor processor running in the um, ESP32 or an 8266 would be dedicated in this case. You know, you wouldn't be programming it to do anything user-ish. It will be dedicated. It's certainly an option to add it in. It does add to the cost, though, because you're adding the SPS2, uh, sorry, the ESP32, you're adding the antenna, you know, you're adding at least $2, I would imagine, for the bill of materials, minimum, minimum, as well as adding to complexity on the board. But those issues are effectively solvable. 
if Wi-Fi is important. I don't know what anyone else feels. I know it's important to Laurie. I don't know about you, Ed, if you're still around or whether you've disappeared. Um, there are endless things you can do with Wi-Fi. <laughs> I mean, it's nice to have. There's no doubt about it. Um, certainly. It's a shame that Expressive don't make a more powerful um, chip. They probably will do one day. For example, connecting keyboards and mice over Wi-Fi. Mm. Okay, so I mean, those are the base things I wanted to cover this evening. Um, I know we're going to discuss these further on the forum, etc. Uh, I wanted to give an update really on the... Um, the amalgam board and where we are with that and some of the decisions that um, that I'm facing uh, I am kind of getting hurry up signals from Shenzhen about getting this done because they're sitting on the components there um, so I do need to do this I do need to make some decisions on it and I'd like to get it out anyhow I wanted to do this for some time. It would be nice to have an ECP5 uh, board as well. Um, so please do give me feedback on this. Um, and we can certainly start talking about this down in the forum as well to kind of punch out some of the details. I need to have a think about the Wi Fi side of things need to look at what it will be in terms of bill of materials additions um, costs that kind of thing as well as squeezing everything on the board of course um, I mean looking at this it looks possibly more sensible to have the chip on the board rather than the module, the module's looking large <laughs> in comparison and gives us a lot less flexibility um, in terms of board layout. This is a big sucker, takes up quite a bit of room, relatively speaking. And I will have to juggle things around significantly in order to fit that in. Whereas this will probably be simpler however I do have to add a whole bunch of other stuff or the decoupling I don't need to add any additional power supplies we've already got those covered <clears throat> there's a few configuration pins that I'd need to think carefully about maybe I can program those from the STM32 I don't want to have to put extra buttons on just to configure those um, so that could be remote um, remote controlled almost in its entirety from the STM32 or, or from circuit Python uh, it doesn't have to be circuit Python by the way it could be a micro Python uh, I think MicroPython has got some quite good STM32 support. Uh, I haven't looked at the detail of that yet, but we may have more options than we have on Alloy. On Alloy, we didn't have any choice because the ST, sorry, the ESP32 um, S2 uh, is not supported by MicroPython yet. Uh, yes, Circuit Python does have some uh, initial support. It's not thorough support in terms of oh, most of the a lot of the peripherals are supported, but it's very new, still only beta in terms of um, 
in terms of its uh, development. Um, let me have a quick look. I can't remember. So MicroPython, MicroPython. Is there a ports list somewhere for MicroPython, Laurie? I can't remember where you find it. I might have to look at the um, port specific libraries. Uh, hold on. Do you have a preference, um, Laurie, in terms of MicroPython slash CircuitPython? Hi, Ed. Welcome back. I'm not sure how long, much longer I'm going to be going here because my daughter's going to give me a call in a minute and I've got to go out and pick her up. But um, uh, we were just talking about Amalgam, which you can see on the screen here. Um, <clears throat> How do I see the list of ports? Damn it. I did find this before the MicroPython. Versions and downloads. Oh, I don't download on EM. You've used MicroPython more, Laurie, yeah. But do you have a preference, or is that just you know, GitHub? Here we go. Maybe this will show us. So if I look in ports under MicroPython, let me show you what I'm seeing here. That would probably help, guys, wouldn't it? In the dark. Bear with me. Piece of layer. Let's get rid of uh, uh, the CAD. Hold on. Oh, let's turn that on. Uh, ports. So if we look under here, STM32. Yeah, it's got pretty good support by the looks of it. Um, supported MCU series are... F04, F7, L4. It doesn't mention H7, interestingly. Hmm, that's a bit of a surprise. Oh, won't it? The STM32 H7 series has preliminary support. There is a working repo by USB and UART, as well as very basic peripheral support. But some things do not work, and none of the advanced features of the STM32H7 are yet supported, such as the clock tree. Is it that advanced? At this point, the STM32H7 should be considered as a fast version of the STM32F7. That's interesting. So I don't know what that support would be. It's different. And how um, and how up to date is this? Because they've done a new version, haven't they, recently? Does that ref is that reflected here? I'd need to talk to some people that know the STM32 MicroPython side find out yeah that's not really telling me um, much boards what does it say on the boards 
Wow, there's a lot of boards that it supports. Does the Nucleo H743? And it does no, the others. And it does the others. Uh, it does the H7473 and hold on let me look at the configuration here the seven h743 is i think it has more flash has a similar amount of um sram there's a load of stuff for the ulx3 which would just work on this board if it used MicroPython. Well, that's an advantage then. That's one possible advantage of going down this route. Why does it talk about embed tutorials? That's interesting. So it supports LWIP, uh, USSL, I'm not sure what that is. SSL, that must be the encryption library for networking. And it supports the SSL embed utils as well. Um, I don't know if it expects to have the embed stuff on it. That's slightly different at this point. Interesting that it says before about um, this support is new. I don't know if that reflects the because they've recently done a newer uh, version of this uh, MicroPython. There was a big release. Uh, I think it was last month, September where they made some of the changes um, hmm. well that's something we're going to have to look into I think um, interesting what else does this show here does it get pins the how config board what does it say doesn't really give away much. Sorry, forgive me. I'm not hugely aware of all of these configuration files from MicroPython. They're slightly different to um, circuit Python ones. Board has an 8 megahertz high speed external crystal. The following gives a 400 megahertz CPU speed. USB clock, flash latency. So it's got a lot of the peripherals included, serial peripherals, I see. Um, what's the UR? USRS. I'm not sure that is LED. USB. CAN support. SD card support. That's interesting. Uh, oh, Ethernet support. Mm. Yeah, but, but on the um, on the H7, unlike the F7, this chip there is Ethernet support. However, I wasn't going to use that simply because um, if you use the Ethernet support, the only way you can get the pins out for that uh, to the uh, physical interface chip. Um, means stealing a whole crap ton of the ADC channels. And I'd kind of like to have some ADC channels. Um, that's just a bit unfortunate, really, on this particular pinout that, um, that we don't have much in the way of choice. You can't reconfigure that. It has to use the uh, same pins as the ADC pins so even though there is an Ethernet support uh, built into the H7, the STM32 H7 I can't easily use it Lloyd Griffith says Ethernet is better from the FPGA um, yeah I mean that's the other point you've got all the FPGA pins anyhow so not difficult to add Ethernet. You don't want to be putting Ethernet connectors on this board 
because they're just too big it won't fit it's just not practical unfortunately to put ethernet on here so it's probably a good idea to do something like that on the carrier really and have it done through the fpga rather than through the um through the actual uh microcontroller So Saxon Sock supports Ethernet over RM2 or SPI is what Laurie's saying. Yeah. I mean if it, it, not everyone's gonna want it anyhow, but if people do require that, that could be a, a good function uh for the carrier board really. Um Okay. Um, so that pretty much covers the things that I wanted to cover. Are there any uh, questions and stuff that anyone needs to ask? Sorry, I'm being rude using my phone here. I'm just checking with my daughter. <clears throat> uh have i ruled out surdies yes on this particular board i'm afraid i have um laurie because it's not supported by these chips and i've already purchased the chips uh you know they're sitting waiting to be populated onto the board um I mean, it may be worth doing another board at some point that has the Surdies. But in order to use the Surdies, I have to go for a different package. I'd probably have to go for the 381 pin um, package, which is going to be a bit bigger. Uh, that's a bit tighter. I mean, you can go for the other packages, but then you're down to the 0 0.5 mil pitch. Uh, and you have to up your PCB specifications um, quite a bit so that you can do the dog legs and stuff to break out the um, the inner uh, BGA pins. Um, also, it can be more expensive. Those silicon, those chips are much more expensive. If you want the Surdies, it the cost goes up dramatically but yeah i think i I'd, I'd like to do that I, when, i'd like to do that when they work out how to get the um the surdies the 5g surdies properly supporting the usb3 i know they've got some of that stuff kind of running um but it's not quite there yet but um if you could get it to do the USB free, and if you could do it to do the um, um, digital video standard over USB as well, then there'd be a really good reason um, for incorporating that. Because um, for PCIe, I, I, that doesn't really fulfill a market for me at the moment easily I don't see who would need that but for USB free that would be excellent that would be a really cool thing to have um, so Laurie says that's not really a problem for me not having the Surdies. Uh also saying an RTC is useful in Linux can that go on a carrier board well there's an RTC built into the STM32 it's actually pretty sophisticated, Nori. Why not? It's just a bit of software then. Um, will that do what you want? Um, the other good thing is the ADC is a free channel ADC, 3.6 uh, megabit ADC, three of them.
So it's actually quite capable in that department. Battery backup for the RTC. Yeah, we, we could do that. That's not a problem. There's a like a VBAT pin on the STM32 for that purpose. However, I will point out that if we went the circuit Python route, that's not yet. It doesn't fully support the deep sleep modes. It has these kind of core sleep modes. I'm not sure about micro Python. Um, however, that's ongoing, so that's developing quite fast. So I don't expect that to be an issue for too long anyhow. Frankly, it's just currently the support is a bit limited, certainly on circuit Python. I don't know what the support is like on MicroPython. I haven't haven't looked at Deep Sleep um, on MicroPython. How well that's done. But yeah, but battery backup itself, from a hardware perspective, isn't an issue. What you what you have to do is um, you could un on the underneath add a battery slot. I'm just thinking how um, wide that would be, or that could impede things. Not sure about that. Uh, it's possible though. Or you could have it on a um, battery connector. I don't know which is preferable really. Depends on how you're imagining you're going to do your um, battery backup. Uh, if it's just simply for the RTC, then it's normally one of those small, very small coin cells. Um, I've got one here. Uh, something like one of these, I guess. But you can get them, I think, a bit narrower than that. But that would probably fit on the back, something of that kind of nature. Maybe. So the ULX3 has a coin cell, does it? Like that, that sort of thing. It's not difficult to add on. You just got, they, they are a little bit chunky. You need enough uh, space for them. I think height wise is probably all right. It's not gonna interfere with the way that the board fits on. Because there's not normally anything component wise underneath the um, black edge or nothing that sticks up anyhow let's put it that way or shouldn't be um, it's quite possible to do it <clears throat> let me just make a note of that as well Add coin cell RTC backup. Right, folks, uh, I think that kind of wraps it up nicely. Uh, Ed's off now as well. Night, Ed. Thanks for joining us. Um, I've got to go soon as well because I've got to go and pick my daughter up. But um, we can talk about this more on the forum, you know, over the next few weeks as well. Try and get this design you know, bedded down. Um, make some decisions about, you know, Wi-Fi. I've got to get the costs. Have a look at those. Oh, cat wants to out. Etc. Uh, and just double check that I can fit everything in. 
I've still got a bit of room there. It's quite possible to fit that in. You know, having the Wi-Fi on this side, perhaps with these two squeezed up. You have to worry a bit about the inflections because the antenna here would be in between the HDMI connector and the USB. You you normally want the Wi-Fi on a corner, um, or at least the antenna, and you. You really want the antenna very close to the chip, otherwise you have to start dealing with matching networks and all of that kind of stuff, and it gets tricky. I mean, we could move down the HDMI to here and then move the uh, um, antenna up into this corner here. That's entirely possible as well as an option. That might be better, in fact. I'd need to have a play around with that. I hadn't really anticipated putting that on at this point until Laurie mentioned it. So I need to have a a little think and a play around with the positions of things um, and see what is and isn't possible. The other thing you've got to be careful of is that you don't see is, you know, there has to be distance between these two USBs, for example. Otherwise, the... Um, the cables are wider than the sockets, than the USB socket. So if you have the two USB connectors very close together, you can't actually get some of the more wider USB connectors into the sockets or they end up going in at angles, which can be bad. Um, okay, so that will do us. Listen, guys and girls, thank you for joining me. Um, I'm putting some time into this i appreciate it uh let's continue this conversation um if you get a chance to join the forum a bit later if you're not already a member or um if you are it's a good place to come kind of continue these conversations let me just give you the url for that for those that don't know where it is um and i look forward to uh talking to you um Talking to you all very soon. Ciao.